Hello and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fosbero. Today I'm chatting to New York Times and Sunday Times best-selling British author Sarah Pimbra, whose work Stephen King has described as bloody brilliant. Sarah's novels, including Torchwood, The Nowhere Chronicles, Dead to Her, The Forgotten Gods trilogy, and her latest Insomnia, have been published in more than 30 territories worldwide, and she's not limited to print. A dark, complex psychological thriller, Behind Her Eyes, was adapted into a six-part Netflix series, which gripped audiences from the moment it was released last year, and shocked in equal measure as it came to an end. I'm Louise, your secretary. It's nice to meet you. I'll just move to the area. David's kind and generous. I work for your husband. You work with David? Small world. Adele seems perfect. <laughs> They're both happier with me than they are with each other. You shine. What about your wife? In fact, the drama became one of Netflix's most watched shows. And it's ending, well, it was trending on social media. In very simple terms, it's about a single mother who, tired of her role as a secretary, starts an affair with her boss before forging a relationship with his wife. But it's far more than a bizarre love triangle, and nothing is what it seems. Sarah, thank you so much for talking to me today. It's absolutely boiling, isn't it? I'm melting It's boiling, and I think I need to hire you to introduce me at everything now. (laughs) I thought, oh, she's made me sound really good. (laughs) Well, you you are really good, and that's just a very, very small part of your story, which is very exciting. Let's start, if we can, with Behind Her Eyes, which I confess I was one of the binge watchers on Netflix. I started watching it because I knew that I was interviewing you and then just completely got addicted uh, without obviously giving any spoilers away. How do you begin writing a story as complex as that? Well, I always begin at the end. So I'm always working towards the end. So with Behind Her Eyes, I mean, it was a real love or hate book and a love or hate show. But I don't mind when people say they hated it, but I do mind when they say, oh, she just threw that ending on there. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Go back and look from the start. It's all the clues there. So I do have to have my ending before I start any book. So that makes it a lot easier because you know where you're heading. So I can normally see I, I had written the last chapter, which was part of my book pitch. So the whole reveal was in the book pitch. Gosh, that's interesting because often people write the first three chapters, don't they? Or the first few chapters. Yeah, that's different though. That's kind of, if you're trying to sell a book on some, you know, if you're trying to get an agent, you'll give three chapters in or whatever. Was this book was sold already. I just had to, you know, I was just showing them what I was writing. So for me, if you're going to do something twisty, I try and make the pitch as twisty as possible. So you kind of tell it as a straight story and then right at the end, I just whacked that last chapter on. And wow, the twisty. Was like, oh my God. Twisty is a bit of an understatement, mm. isn't it? <laughs> it's definitely, <laughs> definitely twisty. Um, and what was the story behind it? Where did the inspiration for that particular book come from? Well, I really wanted to write about the bad side of love, really. As a single woman, having had lots of relationships, people have always pressurizing you oh you need to fall in love it's and love is great but it's also people get stabbed to death in their kitchens because of love and terrible things happen in the name of love so I kind of wanted to write about that obsessive side of it that is unhealthy and I also wanted to write about affairs it's at that stage in my life where you know I haven't always been perfect and friends weren't always perfect people had reached those stages in their marriages where they were like is this it for life or little glitches so I wanted to write about all of that and mainly I wanted to write about female obsession with other women. We're sort of conditioned from such an early age to see other women as competition rather than allies. I think we've had centuries of conditioning. So a friend of mine years ago, God, about 20 years ago, they're still happily married now, but her husband had a glitch and he went off on holiday and he met this woman and he came back and he said, I was very honest. He said, I've fallen in love with this woman and I'm going to leave. It was a proper midlife crisis moment. But my friend was obsessed by this other woman and the other woman was obsessed by my friend in that it almost became, he was irrelevant to the whole thing. It was like, what she got that I haven't got, what she liked that I'm not. And they both were like it. So I found that really fascinating that it became not about him. It became about the other woman, really. So all of that is kind of tangled up in there. And then I wanted to make it really weird. So (laughs) so I did. And and the conclusion was quite shocking. And it did trend, wasn't it? Oh, that's sorry. Who's that? That's Teddy. That's Teddy. Yeah, sorry. He can be a bit noisy. That's all right. Teddy's like wondering why he isn't part of the podcast. No, Ted's, I think someone's actually like 
having the audacity to walk past our house. And he's like, who are you? What are you doing? Ted, quiet. Oh, very good. Nice. Yeah, no, I was oh. going to say, it's not going to last. It's going to last for about a second. Sorry about that. Oh, don't worry. The conclusion was quite shocking and it did trend on social media. Mm. I think it was hashtag WTF that ending. That was the hashtag from the book. We even had that on tube posters. And when the show was coming out, I remember saying to the producer, Jess, she said, oh, we've had a couple of bad reviews. I said, listen, it doesn't matter because people will talk about it, whether they love it or they hate it. When they get to the end, they're going to talk about it. And, you know, we were quite right. They did <laughs> love or hate. They were talking about it. <laughs> How exciting was it to be approached by Netflix? I mean, have you done anything for them before, Sarah? No, I mean, it, I wasn't approached by Netflix per se. I was, when the book was coming out, I had loads of meetings with lots of different companies in America and here and Left Bank were on the list. So I went to the meeting and at that point, TV was still not really the thing. It was Girl on the Train film was being made. Gone Girl film had just come out. So I really wanted film. So I, you know, I'd had meetings in LA, wanted to sell it to film. But I thought, well, I'll do this meeting. It's polite. So I went to the Left Bank meeting and the whole team were in there and they were so on the money with how they would do it. And they were so confident. I came out and I was like, yeah, I don't care what they're offering. I just want to sell it to them. So they started to develop it and they took it to the BBC who wanted the ending changed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that wasn't going to happen. And then it was just it was just really lucky in that someone they knew at Netflix was reading it and they were like, oh, are the rights available for this? I love this book. And then they found out Left Bank had it and Left Bank make the crown with Netflix. So it became an automatic e and it was the fastest process. I mean, it was literally green lit before they had a script. Was it really? Once, yeah. Once they had a writer, they approved and director, they approved. They just green lit it. So it, it went really fast. I mean, from three years, I think it was from option to screen, which as we all know, is super quick for TV. Yeah, that's really quick. And I know that it was very true to the book, but how much involvement do you have? Do you go on the set? Do you have any say in who's playing the lead characters? Oh, God, What no. sort of process no. is it like? I went, I mean, I have a good relationship with Left Bank and I'm actually writing Insomnia for them. So we're doing oh, the are TV, you? but yeah, but I'm a great believer in it's not my job. If they've hired a writer, I can think of nothing worse than having the author of the book saying, oh, let me just give you notes on your scripts. I'm like, how, how rude would that be? So, I mean, I, I, they offered me the scripts to read before the read through. And I said, no, because I just, I thought I don't want to get involved. It's not my job. So I went to the read through. That was great. The cast were great. I went on set a couple of times. It was great. So yeah, it was a really easy ride. And because it was so faithful to the book, I was really happy with it. And do you give it away more or less on that basis, Sarah? Did they say it will remain faithful to the book? And is that no. a, enough for you? Or, or really, once you've given it away, is it theirs to... It's theirs to do. I mean, I think that's the whole point. You sell the option and that's it. You give up your right to have a say. I mean, I've known a lot of writers who have not sold options because... And it's their prerogative, but they're very precious about how their book is adapted. And I'm like... Yeah, but it's probably not going to get adapted anyway. The odds are on, even with the option, the chances of it getting to TV. So you might as well have an option, get some money in. And then if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, you can resell it. But a lot of writers who get very precious, they're not even big name writers. And I'm a bit like, just take the money and let someone else tell your story. It's, but if the adaptation works well, it looks good for you. If it works badly, you just say, go read the book. You know, it's kind so, of... So paint us a picture of you, presumably sitting on your sofa, watching it go out. Oh my and what gosh. was going through your mind? Well, it was really, you know, it was the most surreal kind of week of my life because it sort of, I don't have a very good pleasure response, as it were. Like, I don't enjoy my successes for very long. I kind of go, okay, that's done, move on. But with this, because it, I mean, I couldn't keep up with the hashtag for a little while. It was so fast, people talking about it. But that, that day it came out, I was like, okay, so we were in lockdown. So I could go to my bubble, which was my mum and my sister lived together. So I went to their house, took a bottle of champagne and was like, right, come on, you, we're going to watch the whole six episodes. We've got nothing else to do. So I'd already seen the first two or the first one because we had an online screening online party. Screening, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so we watched the whole thing with our KFC and our bottle of champagne. But my mum, God love her, she fell asleep. Oh, like, in the, towards the end. And when she woke up, we got to the end and she went, oh, that was very good. She goes, that, that, that Adele, oh, she was a lovely girl before the aliens came. 
And I just was like, what aliens? She was like, weren't there aliens? And we were like, did you fall asleep? She was like, yes, oh, I did. That's brilliant. So, I'm sure she's very proud of you. Yeah, I think she was. I mean, my whole town actually was really excited about it. So I think I kind of expected it to fade quite quickly, but it was number one for like four weeks in the UK. And then it was like number one in nearly every territory that Netflix had for ages. So it kind of had a, I got to enjoy it because it wasn't like a book comes out, you have like a week of stuff and then who knows. Whereas with this, it was like watching people watch it in real time and seeing people tweet about it. I've just watched episode one. I'm not really sure what's going on. And then by episode six, the GIF reactions that were coming off Twitter were yeah, it was amazing. It was really That's incredible. And do you jiggle a few things at the same time? Because you mentioned the insomnia and turning mm. that, and that's adapted for TV. But aren't you also working on a film adaptation of Death yeah, House? Yeah, well? Death House, we're hoping to film next year. I'm just waiting to do a final few notes on that. Insomnia, I'm adapting for Left Bank. I've got an original project. I'm just about to do notes on the pilot for Carnival Productions in the UK. Working uh, with Village Roadshow on an adaptation of someone else's book. Oh. And I'm just about to start a new book. So, yeah, quite a wow. few projects. Gosh, yes. do you have any idea at this stage, again, without giving anything away about the new book, have you already put pen to paper? Literally just got my outline approved yesterday from my... It's, it's another kind of... I guess it follows in the style of Behind Her Eyes and Insomnia. It's that kind of relationship drama. It's kind of really about that point in your marriage where, or any relationship, where you realize that the person you fell in love with isn't really the person you got. You know, when all the glitter falls away and that kind of, oh, what happened to that man I fell in love with or that woman I fell in love with? And then it goes weird. <laughs> so <laughs> so what, I can't really say too much. But yeah. What genre are you writing in? Because I know you write in lots of different thrillers, really. including fantasy, don't you? Yeah, well? I used to write. I don't, I don't so much anymore, mainly because, you know, I'm contracted to write psychological suspense thrillers. So that's what I'm writing. But I always have a bit of weirdness in them. So it's kind of, <laughs> this one has a bit of a haunted house vibe. Wow. Yeah. And we'll talk about insomnia as well. Don't let me forget to talk about insomnia because even, <laughs> even in the title, that kind of puts yeah. a chill down my back. But from reading a few articles about you, I can tell that you had a really interesting childhood. I mm. haven't found out much about your childhood other than that it sounds like you grew up in lots of different places like Beirut and Damascus. I just wonder what your younger days were like, Sarah, and um, with a family who were moving around a lot. Yeah, it was good. I mean, I lived in Syria till I was eight. And then I went to boarding school and my pet, so I was going home for the holidays. It was Sudan and Moscow and South Africa. So they were interesting places, but there was eight years at an all girls boarding school and then two years at sixth form in Edinburgh, which I really loved the Edinburgh part, but the all girls boarding school, no. And I find that like the death house is definitely a boarding school novel. I'm writing my thing with carnival that I'm writing involves a boarding school. So I think there's a lot of cathartic stuff coming out <laughs> from that. So yeah, it was fine. I think I'd probably be a more grounded and, and centered individual without the boarding school element of it. Oh no. So you know? when I was growing up in Lincolnshire in Grimsby, mm. I read back to back when I was little Mallory, Mallory Towers. Towers. Yeah, I thought I was going to Mallory Towers, but I was not. I was going oh. to a place where they locked you in the cellar if you talked up the lights out. Oh, and no. Read all not... your post on the way in and the way out. And terrible thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what did, did your family do interesting jobs? Did your parents work in interesting? My dad was with the Foreign Office. So, yeah, he was. But he was. My parents were both very working class. My dad's dad was a like a local constable in South End. And my dad's mum died when he was about 12. And all the other kids ended up in a children's home for a little while. But he was he was old enough to kind of go and live in a boarding house. So he joined the RAF and then he moved into the foreign office from there. So, you know, they weren't kind of middle class people, you know. <laughs> it was So when I went off to boarding school, I think they thought that was a really good thing, you know, because the office was paying. And they'd never had those opportunities. So, What about your love of writing and literature and, and storytelling? Where does that come and how young were you when you were first gripped? Well, my mum's a massive reader. You know, well, she was. She's more TV now. I think she's like 81. But she used to always read to us. And she had me reading when I was about three, I think. You know, I was well ahead at school. I was, had to go up two classes for English. 
I remember her reading us Treasure Island in the middle of a electricity power cut in Syria and, the, and me and my sister drawing like black dots on our hands. And <laughs> but yeah, so I think growing up in countries where there's no TV because it's all in a different language, so you're having to make up the story of what you're watching. She always made sure we went to the library and got books out. And even if there wasn't a library in any embassy, she started one. You know, Did she? People, yeah, to put books in. And, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I liked Tintin when I was really little. And I think you liked Asterix. Yeah, it? I was going to say Tintin as well. We used to get yeah. the Tintin, oh, Tintin hard Tintin. bags and the Asterix from the, yeah. And on a Friday, because Friday was kind of Saturday, because it was obviously a Muslim country. And we'd go to the library, get our big, We'd have Tintin, Asterix, all those, and then go down to the shop next door and spend our 50 piastres on like a Mars bar or something and sit and <laughs> read for the afternoon. So yeah, it was good. I don't read enough now. There's too much TV and too much work. I was going to say, you know. do, you, do you find time to read? Because it sounds like life is really full on and that mm. you're juggling a lot of balls, whether it be writing or adapting or having the same yeah. things going on at the same time. I think if I was just, I, I was thinking back to when I just wrote like a book a year or even two books a year. There was a lot more time in the day. So now there'll be like Zooms in the evening and then I've got to read this book to see if I want to adapt it. There's always something like, so you can work, end up working 12 hour days. So I need to factor in like an hour in the day where you just like, right, I'm going to read. Because now I've, I've started doing French on Duolingo. So oh, I do that. You? Yeah, I'm on day 200. 50 or something of, oh, without a break that's impressive but i know i mean i still can't speak french but i feel good about it so i do that before i go to sleep now so that's kind of the reading time has gone from there so i need to factor it in but i've also reached the age where if i start reading in the afternoon i'll fall asleep when <laughs> <laughs> you mention french and tintin actually because usually I spend a few days in France every year mm. and I do get slightly obsessed in you know the sort of flea markets and that kind of thing they often sell the old copies of Tintin the hardback ones with the that, lovely those colours. are the ones those are the yeah. ones I used to read yeah well these are in French so even though my French is really really rusty I can't come back without a few because I think they're so beautiful. I'm going to France for a couple of weeks, so I'm now going to have to go and see if I can hunt one down. Well, yeah. since you're learning French, I think exactly. you, should, you should hunt them down. And they sell for just next to nothing, these beautiful, beautiful old books. When you do find time to read, Sarah, who are your favourite authors or what's on your list of, you know, must read that or haven't oh, had time gosh. to read this? Um, who do you like reading? Well, I get sent a lot of proofs. So I end up reading books that about people I don't, no, or never heard of really. I've really enjoyed Alice Feeney's books for a great kind of, you know, good read. Lisa Jewell, I like Stephen King, obviously. I'm reading one by a guy called Dom Nolan. It's massive. It's going to take me about a decade to read, but it's set in Soho in London over three generations. It's called oh. Vine Street. So far, very good. So I'm hoping it's kind of a crime novel, but clearly like a sweeping saga kind of crime novel. Chris Whitaker. John Connolly. There's loads, really. But I tend to, because you get sent proofs and people want you to blurb them, that can feel like work sometimes yes. as well. So yeah. you, you feel like you're reading for work and actually you get a stack of books pile up and often you don't get to them. And then when you do get to them, like a year after they're published, you really enjoy them and think, oh, I should have read that before or whatever. But I t I'm going to take a stack away on holiday. Oh, I met um, John Connolly. John Connolly is one of my favorite. He's authors. one of my favorite people. We get, we, he's like, he introduced me to the Margarita. Did he? Well, yeah, because oh, <laughs> I've never had one. Oh my goodness. I've known him for, for years, about 12 years. He's one of my best friends, really, is writer he? friends. I yeah. think we have to try and get him on the podcast. I turned mm. up like a mini stalker. I went to a Waterstone <laughs> signing in Kensington, but I'd messaged him first because I wanted him to sign a book and this, that, and the other, and he mm. did, and he was amazing. And I just walked up to him at the signing. I was like, oh, I'm Helen. And he's like, oh, I know you are. I think he'd look me up. But And we went for a, we went for a pint afterwards. Yeah, it's, um, he's exactly like that. He's so lovely. Yeah, what a, what a nice man and, mm. and a very, very clever writer as well. Yes. I like yeah. all the books as well. Slough House, I'm just trying to Yeah, that I've watched, that's Mick Heron. Mick Heron, I like Mick yeah. Heron's books as well, but I haven't seen the adaptation of Slough well, House. Well, I'm the other way around. I've seen the adaptation and really loved it. So now I want to read the books. Yeah, the books, you know, the book so, yeah. is fantastic. They say, don't they, Sarah, that in all of us, we've got a novel somewhere. Yeah, but I think for a lot of people, that novel should never come out. Yeah, I think, I think, <laughs> I think you're probably right. Mine definitely shouldn't. But can you give us an insight? I'm always fascinated with the writing process and how mm. one does it. And people have so many different ways. I remember talking to Jeffrey Archer and he goes to his home in Mallorca and he has to write at certain times. So he writes between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m., then takes two hours off and then 10 till 12, two till four, 
And that's the only way he can get a novel written. What's your kind of rhythm and what kind of writer are you? That sounds pretty good, actually. I mean, I am a morning person. And before I had Ted, I would probably have, like, especially in the summer, because it's so light, got up like half five, six, got a cup of tea in my pajamas, just got on with it and got a couple of thousand words down. And then your day starts. But now I have the dog. I'm out for an hour or so. And then by the time you get back, feed them, it's like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning or in the winter, it's later. So I definitely like to work in the morning. I am a planner. So I plan quite a lot, especially when you're working on lots of things. But when I've started a book, I always try and do the book first. Yeah. You know, because if I start editing a script, they're far more all consuming than a book. Because it's like you can see the end when you're starting. Whereas a book, it's, you know, it's going on forever. So I always think if I can get a thousand words or whatever done before doing anything else, at least I feel like the book's making progress. So because it's very easy to to leave the book behind. It's interesting, isn't it, that it's easy to leave the book behind? Mm. Is that just because your mind runs away with structure and, and what else you need to include? And... It's just scripts are just shorter. Yeah. So you get maybe two weeks to hand in a first draft. And I mean, they're not quicker from start to finish you know it'll take us six months to get a decent pilot together before they're ready to send it out by the time everyone's given their notes in and everyone's done this and everyone's done like nine drafts but the initial burst is fast whereas with a book you know you're looking at minimum three months to you know however well planned you are to really get a book ready so it's easy to say oh I'll do that tomorrow I'll do that the next day or they're just different different processes I always say like a a script is like a mistress and a book is like a marriage at first the script's all consuming and exciting and then you just can't wait to get rid of it <laughs> whereas a book is like it can be a hard slog at times but you you know once you're in it you're there till the long run you know so and of course with a book you're relying on all the detail and lighting up people's imagination with the words where of, of course in a script you've got the visuals to support the words haven't you so I guess less is more sometimes because oh of in a script definitely and I think it, it all feeds into novel writing like insomnia is is pacier than my normal books because I was writing scripts as well and I was writing the script of insomnia so it was like I'd had written like 20,000 words and I scrapped 10 of them because I was like no I don't need to start there it's start more in the action so yeah it does and your dialogue gets better I think when you write scripts and tell us about insomnia because as I said earlier it did that just the title sends a bit of a <laughs> chill down my spine because I can just imagine lying awake in the depths yeah. of the night and that's sometimes where dark thoughts or the demons yeah. play havoc hey yeah the, de the depth of night is no one's friend yeah so insomnia is about a woman called Emma who is a career woman with a stay-at-home husband she's a divorce lawyer so on the surface, her life is great, but she's peddling like mad underneath. So she's still doing everything at home. And, you know, like the dad's a stay-at-home dad, but she still has to remind him when things are going on at school and stuff. And so before her 40th birthday, a couple of weeks before her 40th birthday, she stops sleeping and she develops some ticks in the night. Like she has to check the back door at this time and she has to, you know, she gets quite obsessive, which for a normal person is bad enough. But Emma's own mother went mad just before her 40th birthday and did something terrible. And it started with her not sleeping. And her mother always told her the same thing was going to happen to her. So she gets in this paranoia. And, you know, I mean, I don't sleep very well. I mean, I sleep better than Emma in my book. Anybody who doesn't sleep knows how mad you go. I mean, like you go, they say if you go three nights with no sleep whatsoever, you will start hallucinating. Really? Yeah. I mean, like people talk about water and food. Sleep is the killer. If you go without sleep, I think 11 days is the longest you can go without sleep oh, before wow. you die. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, if you look up the effects of no sleep. It's the paranoia and everything that comes with it. So I was, it was playing on that really. But again, it's, it's got a little bit of a speculative edge. That's it, speculative it. edge. Yeah. I love the way you describe yeah. your, your <laughs> twists. And I, I, I don't know, I, think, I wonder if as we get older, I think our minds are so busy. I, I was always an eight hours a night person. And mm. I, my head hit the pillow and I was off and woke up eight hours later. And I struggle a lot now to go to sleep. I don't know whether we've just got more going on in our minds. I or... think it's a female thing as well. Is it? I think, yeah, I and a lot, it came out from talking to a lot of women who just, especially over the pandemic, stopped sleeping. You know, like I think we worry more than men as a rule. I'm generalizing, yeah. obviously. We worry more than men. And then our bodies change in a way that men's don't. As your hormones shift and change and you stop sleeping. And I'm mid-menopause. Well, I'm probably post-menopause, actually. 
but I couldn't do HRT because that made me want to top myself. And so you have, yeah, I just think there's so much going on. And when you look it up, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's why my mind is racing at night. And that's why, you know, you're having all these mood swings and stuff. So I think, think women have more to contend with in a lot of ways. It's nice to see as well that the menopause is getting a much higher profile mm. and a lot of celebrities have taken it, you know, like Davina McCall and yeah. Mariella Frostrop particularly when there's been a shortage of medication for women who need it and, and take it. And I'm glad to see it's more talked about now because it's the oh, most natural that, thing in the world. All yeah, our and like our drink. mother's generations and their mother's generations, I think, God, our poor grandmothers who just got on with it. And now, I mean, I, I find it so funny. I talk about it all the time because like I'll be in a meeting, like especially Americans, you've been in a meeting with a bunch of execs and they're all lovely, but there might be a lot of men and I'll be like, oh, sorry, I'm just massively menopausal today. And they all kind of go like, they don't know what to say. But I'm like, we need to talk about it because otherwise it just is. I think, God, if I was still teaching now, there are some days like I'd really struggle just to go in after like two hours sleep or whatever. I just think, no. On the sleep front, I think exercise massively mm. helps. I've got into yeah. a crazy routine, which isn't very popular in my household, but a few days a week, I get up at half five. I'm on the bus at six yeah. and I go and train at seven. But I have to allow all that time. It's not actually that far to go, but because it's of difficult. tubes and buses. Yeah. But honestly, once I've got my headphones on and music and I'm on the bus or on the tube on the way to the gym, yeah, I love it. And I do you leave, feel better. I leave slightly smug. Uh, smug isn't anything to be proud of or very nice, really. <laughs> but, but no, you're allowed to be smug. But I leave also. slightly smug when I see all the commuters racing yeah. off the tube on my way home and, and I've just been put through my paces in the gym. Well, but, that's like, I get back from the park at about 10 to 7. So we've done like an hour and a half in the park. We're in the park at half past five. Then, you know, so you're kind of like, I'm sitting down with a cup of tea. I always feel that it feels like lunchtime to me by the time yeah. nine, nine o'clock hits when I've done one of those days. But oh, 10 30 I'm pecking I'm like where's my lunch yeah it's you know, good like I've been up since four it's good for you endorphins and, and also yeah I, I always find when I mean I don't write like you but when I'm writing the podcast or doing any writing I feel I can do it much better when I've got up early I feel there's a lot more clarity going on in my mind yeah. rather than that brain fog if I've had a lion well I've started to do more now because I broke my back last year did so you it's been like yeah oh, so I've goodness. had like a year of so I've started to do I used to do like Sean T insanity years ago which I couldn't do now but I'm doing my Pilates and I started to do a couple of sort of semi hit ones. So I've just started to do jumping, wow. which my body's like, what is this jumping? We haven't done this. But, you know, I'm kind of like, how's my back going? Oh, OK, we can do that. That's- oh. So it's slow. Kind of sometimes it's two step forward, one step back. But you're right. It definitely makes you feel better mentally when you've done yeah, go on. Hats Something. off to you for doing insanity. I know a few people who do insanity, and I haven't, oh, haven't I didn't do it anything like the people on the video were doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing my very own version. Yeah, but you you had a go, and gosh, you slipped yeah. that in that you broke your back. How how did you do that, Sarah? It was very exciting. Was it? I was carrying no, oh. it really wasn't. <laughs> I was carrying a Hoover in a box, and I was like, oh, I'll unbox this. The sad thing was, I was quite excited about it. And as I kind of hurried into my kitchen, the box hit the door jam and I landed on my ass and I felt my hips come up and my spine come down and it just concertinaed. Oh, dear. And I thought, but, so I didn't obviously go to the doctor. And then I finally went to the doctor who told me I'd torn a ligament. And I was like, I have not torn a ligament. I need an x-ray. And they said, no, 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 it's not worth it. So then I went to a physio and he was like, oh my God, don't pass go, go straight to a specialist, get some scans. So by the time I'd kind of got to the scans and everything, I mean, I should have been laying flat on my back in a brace and I obviously hadn't been. So it's taking a little bit long. I think I've got another year to go before I know how the levels are. But Gosh. yeah. Are you in pain it at turned all? Out, some, yeah, but not nothing like it used to be. But it turned out when I had the MRI that they found out that I'd broken my back before when I'd broken some ribs, which explained a lot of things. So actually... <laughs> That's the postman. Actually, it's it's worked out okay because it's it's made me understand why I've had various issues with hips and stuff. It's because of a previous back break. So oh there's a lot of physio going on. There's wow. a lot of physio. And I feel a bit, you know, feeble, but I'll get there. It's like, you know, you just got to build everything back up again, haven't you? Yeah, and you just got to be patient and it takes time. How does the postman feel about Ted, by the way? Uh, well, all the postmen in my town have a mission to make Ted like them. And he's determined. There's one, one he likes. And she's a woman. <laughs> oh, and, and what, what is yeah. Ted? I mean, imagine Big Rock Viola, but I think you're going to say something smaller, aren't you? He's a Romanian rescue. He looks like a fat fox. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, he's like, he's this funniest looking dog. But yeah, he sounds like a big fierce dog and he comes up to about my knee. So oh, yeah. Bless him. Yeah. Now we've got Ashley Stockwell to thank for introducing us, mm. actually, from Convex, who, yeah. who this podcast was originally commissioned by. Because is it insomnia that features a character called Parker Stockwell? Parker Stockwell. Tell yes, me about Parker pl- Stockwell. He's not a pleasant man. Parker Stockwell is... Uh, one of Emma's clients and he is trying to get custody of his children and he says that his wife is dangerous and not a good mother and all this stuff so and he's a bit smarmy and he tries to shag Emma she's not having any of it so Park Stockwell was the name one in the auction the Amanda Redmond auction so yes that's yeah. such a lovely thing to do so basically you offered to write a character yeah I do it. it for quite a lot of charities and and often in the edit someone will say oh can we change this character's name and I'm like no we can't because that character has paid good money for that so, oh, yeah. that's a lovely yeah. thing to do oh I might, yeah. might actually give you a call about that I like going to auctions and also coming up with unusual prizes and there, I've yes. never heard of that before yeah a lot of authors do it in various gosh in various what a lovely things. thing to do well yeah. I know Ashley's very chuffed about Parker Stockwell and, ah, and how excellent. he came up with the name I think it's his yeah. wife's maiden name and then I wondered Ashley. how the name I wondered what the link was with the name yeah, yeah. I think it's Mandy yeah. Parker and, and, and Ashley see. Stockwell, who's very popular. okay. Now I understand. Yes, now you understand. Well, I wasn't sure if it was a brother or a child or something. Yeah, like. well, he's very chuffed about that. And Stephen King, I said in the introduction, has said your work is bloody brilliant. Oh. How do you feel about his critique as one of your favourite authors? Well, the first time, God, years ago, and the Death House wasn't even out in America at the time. And I went on Twitter. It must have been about 2014, 2015. And I kept seeing my name and Stephen King's and the, and the New York Times all in the same tweets. And I was like, that's just never going to happen. What's going on there? And he had talked about the Death House in the New York Times. I couldn't even understand how he'd read it. And it transpired that a bookseller that he knew had a UK copy and said to him, you're really going to like this book. So he had sort of raved about the Death House, which was great. And then obviously he raved about Behind Your Eyes as well. So that was doubly great. But he's a big book supporter now he's on Twitter. He's very good at saying nice things about people's work. Have you ever met him? Yes, I went to his son's wedding. Did you? Yes, his son married my old editor. So, oh, hang on, just so you can have a little look. Oh, there's, gosh, he does look like a fox. Hello. There's Ted jumping into the shot. Hello, Ted. I'm sorry this isn't television, otherwise we (laughs) I know, I just... (laughs) But I'm sure he'll definitely be featured somewhere in our our podcast. He's very sweet, actually. Um, yeah, he's cutie. Uh, so yeah, he's yeah, he seems very nice. I mean, obviously he's Stephen King, so I don't, you know, like I was just a bit high pitched and overexcited. <laughs> oh, <gosh. laughs> and just when you're writing, just going back to that writing process, when you write out your structure, do you use a notebook at all, or are you all mm, computerized? Yeah, or? I've got notebooks for everything. Have like you spider diagrams and. Wow. Every, every project has a notebook. You my sound my kind of, of my kind of writer. I still got a written diary and my written notebook every day, and it has to be squared paper. I like the, yeah, I like I, the moleskin notebooks. So I go. Yeah. Them. Oh, I'm not. So I like an A4 notebook. But squared yeah, paper. To, sometimes squared paper, depending Ooh. on the book. It just, just makes me feel more creative. And, yeah. and do you ever get that moment, Sarah, where you feel a bit of writer's block or ever have a day where you think, you know what, I'm just not into it today. So I'll <laughs> Every <pump>. day. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know so much about writer's block. I sometimes get like tired, like I'm a bit tired of books, but then you start a new book and think, oh, actually, I'm really enjoying this again. It's harder. The more money you get paid, the more people want you to fit a box. You know that a lot more thought goes into your book ideas from the publisher's side because you know they want to build a brand or build this or build that whereas when I was earning less money I could pretty much write whatever I wanted because they knew they'd make their money back but now when they're paying you more you've got to kind of so that can be a bit hard coming up with the right idea but sometimes you just need to not think about it the idea for this book I I literally had nothing and I was going to write a straight crime novel then I was watching a really bad film I can't even remember what it's called I think it was Ben Affleck it was a really terrible film and then I just got the idea for this book from that film just while I was watching it and I thought ah okay this could work so yeah I don't really get writer's block I just get tired (laughs) (laughs) and do you love what you do as a career a lot of people write and they don't make a success of it it's very difficult it's like acting isn't it it's very difficult Mm. profession to be in and to find the success that you need to live well but are you really thrilled that that's how life worked out for you and that you've become a successful yeah I am I would always write whether I was 
successful or not. Obviously, I always wanted to be successful and have a career. But I, you know, even before Behind Her Eyes, I was making a good living writing. You know, they weren't bestsellers, but it certainly could live. It wasn't like I was having to get a job or anything. But yeah, I am. I think sometimes I have to remember that I am because it become, every job becomes a job, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, work is work is work. But I can't imagine having a nine to five. The closest I came was when I did a writer's room last year and I had to be online for three hours a day, like five days a week. And that felt like a job. I was like, oh God, I've got to, you know, like someone's dictating my schedule. Yeah, I don't think I could do a proper job. I've been lucky. I do a job I love in journalism and broadcasting and don't really feel like I've done a proper day's work. But that's the thing, isn't yeah. it? Even if you're doing something you enjoy, it doesn't feel like you've, you know, like, it's like when I go into town for a meeting and I see other friends go for meetings and they're in like suits and I'm in like jeans and a t-shirt, like, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and what do you think was the tipping point that sort of tipped you from writing and having a certain level of success to then that tipping point where the difference happened. And oh, Behind Her Eyes. Was that Behind Her Eyes? Wow. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. I mean, I got paid a lot of money by America for the book. HarperCollins gave me a massive push. So that book did change. I mean, 13 Minutes was quietly doing its own thing and that sold a lot of copies. That was a YA thriller. But Behind Her Eyes was definitely the one that, you know, it went to number one. It was it just, you know, it was number one in lots of countries. And so, yeah, that definitely upped my stakes upped your were. stakes gosh <laughs> yeah. today's a perfect example of this is work and actually spending 40 minutes or 30 yeah, minutes it's in your a chat, isn't time it? it's a nice been, chat over a cup of tea yeah that's been fantastic <laughs> what does your day hold today are you writing today i have got to edit a script i've got to rework a verbal pitch for a tv show and i'm waiting for some notes to come through on my book outline but yeah those are my main two things I think. well I'm, I'm going to try not to fall asleep on the sofa <laughs> no don't fall asleep on the sofa I'm going to leave you to it and uh, thank you thank so you much so for much. finding time today so you've been a really really wonderful guest it's been a, an absolute pleasure thank you pleasure. for having me it was so nice you're very and thank you for my headphones oh well, I, hope, I hope you enjoy them you look very yeah good it's like Thanks. I sent those weeks ago, didn't I, actually? I know. I know, months ago now. I've had plenty of practice. I know. Well, well, you had all the other issues going on, didn't you? Uh, well, right. I lost my lovely dad, and you were mm. very kind about moving moving the date. But, uh, yeah, it was really kind of you to do that. And no, I mean, I've been there, pet. so it's, you know, it's not a good time. No, is it? and even though, you know, 95% of you knows it's a blessing at 88 when somebody's not well. It's still, still your dad. It's still you know, your dad. It's still your dad. And you still wake up in the morning forgetting that he's not yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. Or pick up the phone to ring him to tell him. He mm. would have really enjoyed today's interview. He was a oh. journalist for 46 years. And oh, wow. still, 25 years after he retired, still every day, was kind of editing the local newspaper in his armchair, learning <laughs> about the mistakes and the typos and the, the number of Brilliant. adverts and stuff. So he was, he was, a, he was a fabulous writer in his sort of regional world, which was yeah. great. So oh, wonderful. I'm going to let you get on and, uh, and just say a massive thank you again. It's been brilliant. Thank you it's for been, having me. It's been nice to meet Ted as well. I do hope the postman survived. Yeah, I'm the sorry day. about his interruption. Don't worry, it's absolutely <laughs> fine. You've been listening to best selling author Sarah Pimbra. If you've never read one of Sarah's gripping novels, then I'd highly highly recommend you do they should definitely be on your summer reading list and if you missed behind her eyes on netflix then prepare to shut yourself away for a few hours you're in for a treat don't forget to download and subscribe to our series at convex.podbean.com or search the convex conversation on spotify stitcher apple and google podcasts or wherever you listen to yours i'll be back next week with another great guest maybe not a dog like ted so see you then 